So the one thing that I learned as a child was I saw black people buying real estate, investing in real estate, owning properties, having rental properties. So I had this mindset, whenever you catch it, once you know what you can do in real estate, it's hard to be able to do something else. Then we went to a war. Wow, and then and all of the military yeah, bases. all the military people left. <laughs> yeah. And we're losing them <laughs> yeah. under, you know, yeah. with all the resources available to us yeah. in the world. So yeah. that's that's the real yeah. frustrating part. Yeah. I heard money don't grow on trees, but I still believe I can achieve. Cause cash rules everything around me, around me, around me, around me. Money don't grow on trees, but I still believe. Welcome to another episode of the Black Money Tree Podcast. Today, episode is all about real estate, one of my favorite topics. Yes. And we are here with Houston uh, real estate royalty, Miss Dr. Courtney Johnson Rose. She also serves as the president of the National Association of Real Estate Brokers. Yes. Welcome to the Black Money Tree Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, it's been a while. I've been trying to get you for a, a, a while now. I thought my fellow Longhorn I would got have you uh, got me in a little bit earlier, but at least we got it done. We're making now. it happen. We're making it happen. So I want to start back and I want to go. You and I went to lunch, I guess, several years ago. Yes. And we had a conversation that that always kind of stuck with me. Okay. You, uh, your dad was in real estate. You grew up around real estate. Yes. And you told me that you weren't sure if you wanted to go into real estate. Yes. And I remember you made a statement. You said, well, I knew I could make about $400,000 in real estate, but I wasn't sure that was the direction I wanted to go. And in my mind, I was like, wow. <laughs> she just knew she could make $400,000 like that? And I did a little research. It, it, the U.S. Bureau of Labor says that the average U.S. salary in Q4 of 2023 is 59384 Wow. So 400000 is is way over yeah, that number. Yeah. So I want to know, where did that confidence come from to know that you can make that type of money at that early age? You know, I've been so blessed to be a second-generation real estate broker, real estate developer. My father, George Johnson, started in real estate before I was born in 1974. This year we'll actually celebrate 50 years of being in the real estate industry. So the one thing that I learned as a child was I saw black people buying real estate, investing in real estate, owning properties, having rental properties. So I had this mindset. When I was eight years old, my dad had a Century 21 office. He was one of the first African Americans in the country to be able to buy a Century 21. We had about 80 agents at that time. So I saw all these black professionals. We had a title company in our office. We had a mortgage company in our office. We had one office off of South Post Oak. We were building another office off of Fuqua. And I remember when my dad was building the building, I, I used to go in there and roller skate because it was all <laughs> concrete floors. This is my dad's building. I remember when they said, hey, we're doing the carpet tomorrow. I was like, no, y'all can't do the carpet. This is my best roller skating ring. Yeah. So just to be able to see that, to grow up and see your parents develop their own office, see 80 black real estate agents running around selling properties, to see families coming in buying their first home, I always had this perspective on real estate that you can do anything. And that perspective is kind of what I brought to the, to the table to know, okay, a career in real estate is there for me. But the crazy thing, Jerome, is that my parents did not want me to do real estate. Wow. So my dad was very intentional about me going to college. Like you mentioned, we're, we're, we're Longhorn, so um, I wanted to you know, go to certain schools. He's like, no, you're going to the best business school in, in the state. You know, you're gonna, you know, go through the whole process. I was an Enrose intern, so I enrolled, so I interned with Accenture, and they offered me a position upon graduation. And my parents really encouraged me to go see the world, if you will, get into corporate America, get that business acumen, understand big business. And then they said, if you want to come back to real estate, there's a place for you. But first, don't come here first. Yeah. Go to the big world first, and then if you want to come back then you're welcome to come back. But they wanted me to have that experience first. So I always knew that real estate was there for me, that I had a company uh, that my parents had, had uh, built. My siblings are part of the business too. So I always knew in the back of my mind, no matter what, I can go back to real estate. It was gonna be there. And I'm so blessed that it's been built for me 
to be able to have an opportunity to come in and be a part of a family business that's been successful for the past 50 years. The Black Money Tree Podcast is brought to you by The Collective. Planning a corporate event, seminar, or podcast in the Houston area? Make sure you check out The Collective. Located moments from downtown in the heart of Houston, it's the perfect venue for any type of event. With over 17,000 square feet of event space, The Collective is Houston's largest Black-owned event venue. The Collective is the perfect backdrop for hosting and recording corporate events, conferences, seminars, and more. Their space is designed to be transformed into whatever you envision. The Collective features a state-of-the-art podcast video production studio and staging area, ensuring professional, high-quality images for all of your production needs. They collaborate with a variety of vendors, including video and sound technicians, world-class caterers, and event decor specialists to ensure that your event comes out nothing short of timeless. The venue's versatility means that it can be transformed to match whatever you envision. Book your event now and click the link in the description and use the promo code BLACKMONEYTREE for special discounted rates. Make your next event timeless. So was the advice not to go into real estate, was that just for you as the baby girl or was that for you know, your brothers as well? That's an interesting thing because I've always felt like it was just for me as the baby girl. Okay. You know, the entrepreneurship, you know, the pressure, um, real estate, as you know, from being a part of it with investing and things like that, it's a lot of risk. Um, it can be uh, somewhat stressful. Um, so I always felt like my parents, you know, particularly my dad, you went to college, you graduated top of the class, you know, go to the corporate America, make a bunch of money there, sit in the air condition all day long. You know, I felt like he wanted that easier path for me and yeah. set me up to have that easier path. Yeah. But once you catch the real estate bug, yeah. even if you catch it when you're eight years old or 10 years old yeah. or, or 40 years old, whenever you catch it, once you know what you can do in real estate, it's hard to be able to do something else. True story, what really made me quit my job, I was working at Accenture, had my real estate license. Uh, but I was still in corporate America. <clears throat> I saw a condo for sale. It was 25000 Bought that condo, and it was in the gallery, excuse me, it was in the medical center area. And the Houston announced the Super Bowl. So that same $25,000 condo, I flipped nine months later for $52,000. Yeah. You couldn't tell me I wasn't a real estate yeah, mogul yeah, yeah. <laughs> at that point. Yeah. I was like, you know, Dad, I got the eye. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I really understand this. Yeah. So, you know, there was a few things that happened that was successful early on in real estate when I was part time that kind of drove me to say, hey, I think I can really do this. I think I have the capacity to do this, the drive to do this, mm -hmm. the work ethic to really be successful in yeah. it. You know, it was interesting. You said I had a similar thing. I bought. Yeah. A condo in Austin, the yes. Chamonix con uh, condo. Austin's a big of market Tour. too. Oh yes, Old seventy-one thousand dollars. Yeah, sold it nine months later for ninety-two thousand. Just like hey. And then I bought a duplex <laughs> right yes. off of Burnett uh, Road. Yes, good street too in which Austin. Which I sold the day before. The, actually, it was supposed to close the day of nine eleven, and then the planes oh, hit, so wow. the wire was didn't go through. Wow. I sold it the day after that. Yeah. made another thirty, forty thousand. You like I was like, man, this I'm is the roll. easiest money you can make. <laughs> yes, yes. Then I yes. bought a fourplex in Colleen. Okay, Colleen, um, Texas. I don't remember what the price was. Probably about forty, fifty thousand yeah. dollars. Then we went to a war. Wow, and then and all of the military yeah, bases. All the military people left. <laughs> so my building went from being worth eighty thousand to yep. forty thousand and my rents was cut in half yep. and I was upside down. <laughs> and at the time I had just bought my house in Austin and I was moving to Houston. Yep. I was starting Black Expo. Black like <laughs> Expo had me a hundred thousand in the hole. So now I'm trying to pay for a property in Colleen, pay for a house. You went from real estate yeah. mogul to yeah. it, it, it happens real fast. Quick, real quick. And I think my dad, you know, with thirty, forty plus years of real estate experience knows that yeah knows yeah, that yeah. you could be on a real big high uh -huh. and riding the wave yeah. and it can drop just yeah. like that so you know I had to learn the markets had to learn the cycles you know but it has been um, a wonderful journey uh, for yeah. me this year uh, 2024 marks 24 years yeah. in the real estate business and 20 years 
full time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we're yeah. about the same. I got my license when I was 20. When I was in okay. college, I think it was 90. Oh, you were in college. Okay. I was in college. Yeah. Okay. I was the apartment locator in the in the, in the summers. <laughs> write, write my name on the application. <laughs> write my name on. So that was my summer job. Okay. You know, I was making 18, 20 thousand dollars wow. in the summers doing apartment locate. Doing apartment locate. And then for I all went the full time right after I graduated. Wow. So yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty so cool. So tell me. What are some of the things that you learned from your dad that you're now passing along to your kids? Yeah. I've come here times and I've seen them sleeping yes. on the couches and stuff, so I know they're learning the business. But tell me some of the things that you've learned from your dad that you're passing yeah. on to your kids. You know, it really is a blessing. And my dad does a great job, too, with my, my kids, that if each of them have an office, if you really have a desk. Um, um, at our at our main corporate office, of course, we have uh, the community collective here that they are a part of, and get to see the main things that we want to expose them to is that they can do it. And I believe strongly when you see the example that was for mm -hmm. for me when I saw black people buying real estate, owning real estate. I saw my dad running the uh, company. I saw the people who who worked for him. When I saw that, it gave me the confidence. So a lot of it is making sure that your children are in the environment with you. One thing I encourage clients is when they're buying a property, bring their kids to close them. Yeah. That's the best thing. Uh -huh. They miss school for doctor's appointments yeah. and shots and all other kind of stuff, yeah. braces, et cetera. When you're buying a property, bring your kids yeah. so they know what we just did. They're not intimidated by this process because they've seen you do it. So the one thing I try to do, um, and my husband and I try to do with our kids is expose them to we are here, this is ours, this is how this works. We don't hide it from them. And my, I was blessed that my parents did not hide that from me. Yeah. And that's just that exposure does a great deal for a child's confidence. Yeah. No, I think you're so right. And that's why I really felt compelled yes. to ho start the whole Black Money Tree movement and the yes. essence of Texas Black Expo. Let's talk about it. This yeah. year, we had a few programs, Finance, okay. Entrepreneurship, Wealth Development. We partnered Phew, with the like MBA. Okay. So we're teaching students entrepreneurship, wealth yes. development all across the state. But more, what's more powerful than that classroom experience yeah. is them actually coming to Black Expo. Yes. They were there the day before Shannon Sharp was there. They saw the empty ballroom. They were the ones who set up the linens on yes. the tables and the chairs. Yes. One of the young ladies said, well, I like to be in production. So she sat over with my sound and AV guy. And, and sat in the back the and got to see how, yeah. how things work. So then the next day when it's transformed with all the glitz and the glam. And all the people yeah, in the seats. And, and, and they could see yeah. how it was before and after and together. how it comes together. I think yeah. that's an invaluable it is. Um, experience. And Certainly, my kids have been very involved with my business as yes. well. They've been prospecting uh, beat up, burned out houses out in <laughs> South Park, Sunnyside. Take them um, with you. They, they know exactly, but yes. I think that's very important. Yes. Um, and we got to have as a community, I'd, I'd say the infrastructure and the ability to yeah. be able to do that. Yes. But this, that's a blessing. Exposure. So, Exposure. So talk a little bit about the importance of building a team. I know we've talked about this yeah. before. Because you yeah. can't do anything yourself. And you've yeah. been blessed. A lot of people can't work with family, but you've been blessed yeah. with your husband <laughs> particularly. And y'all yeah. seem to work together. I know it's probably some stuff going on we don't see, but y'all seem to work yeah. together as a team. What have y'all figured out that yeah. other people don't know? You know, I think that I, because I grew up in the family business, I've always appreciated that. And I've been in both worlds where, you know, I've had the family business uh, with my parents. Um, but I've also worked in corporate America where you get in there and you don't know who to trust and you know depends on which side you're on and who brought you in and all these other dynamics so for me I've always enjoyed that the environment is a family type environment you can just focus on the work because when I was in corporate I felt like there was a lot of focus on maneuvering a lot of focus on politics a lot of focus on all those yeah. things other than the work so I have personally have um, enjoyed it. Uh, the one thing that I think um, that we struggle with, uh, that's with my husband, with my parents, with my uh, siblings, and we have to be very conscious of it, and that is bringing it home. Yeah. So we have this thing that we do called First Sunday with my, um, my family, my siblings, my parents. And we can sit around First Sunday, and if the topic comes on the office, you know, there's somebody that's usually conscious and says, hey, 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 hey. One of the spouses or somebody says, hey, y'all, time out. 
you know, y'all can't talk about that here. Let's talk about basketball. Let's talk about weather. Let's talk about the kids. Let's yeah. figure out how to separate this because once that topic starts coming up, it's like, yeah. oh, we need to do this tomorrow. We need yeah, to do this. Yeah, snowball. <laughs> snowball. <laughs> okay, you can't stop. Yeah. Same thing with uh, my husband and owning, uh, uh, being a part of the community collective together. It's like at some point, you know, it's a million things to do, a million things to talk about regarding the business, but at some point, it just has to turn off. Yeah. So I think that's what we've learned and are learning over the years in yeah. terms of being a part of a family business. So you kind of already went there. We're sitting right now in the collective. Yes, yes. The largest, the largest. African American event venue in the city of Houston. Yes. It kind of has a rich history. Your yeah. dad helped to develop not only this facility, yeah. but I think several hundred acres of land yes. around here, houses. Yes. And you recently, along with some of your partners, yes. acquired the building. Yes. Tell me, how does that feel to purchase a building, a development of this size that your dad actually developed. Yeah, it's an honor. And this was um, an important investment because as it, the building needed to transition, previous owners, you know, wanted to transition out of it. You don't want it to not be a part of our community. You know, to say we have one of the largest assets in the city, one of the largest event venues, um, you don't want to lose that. And you don't, you know, it's plenty of people that would buy it. It's a busy corner, 90,000 cars a day, a week, et cetera. So you can sell it. But I was very pleased to be a part of a of an ownership group that came together to say this was important to keep this asset in our community and to keep, most importantly, doing the services that are important to our community. We're very proud to host uh, most of our Greek letter organizations here. We're proud to host several nonprofits here. Uh, we're proud to have several small businesses here. So, you know, we did not want to see this go and just be something else. Yeah. But to be what it was intended to be um, and to be able to keep that legacy going is yeah. something that's truly an honor yeah. to be a part of. And you know, what I love about it is, the, for me, I think one of the most important things about having businesses in yeah. the black community, we talk about keeping money in our community. Yes we have to have ways of extracting money from other communities to yes. bring to our community. community. Correct, and very important. you guys got several colleges that yes. have graduations, and those aren't black owned colleges. Yes, yes, so charter you, school yeah, districts, yeah. et cetera. So you it's have important. A, 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 a tremendous venue that's able to extract money from yes. other communities. Very important. Bring into this community. So that we can build our own community. Yes, yeah. and then yeah. reinvest. Yeah, so. yeah. very, very important because a lot of times it's like well, we want to recycle the uh, dollar but you, you got to have the dollar first yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> you know you got to get the dollars yeah so yeah, yeah. yeah. so now swift to switch to real estate a little okay. bit more in depth you serve as the president of the national association of real yes. estate brokers for those that don't know explain what NARAB yes. is. yes so NARAB national association of real estate brokers is the premier network of black real estate professionals started in 1947 and this is so uh, um, interesting to me because when we started, African Americans could not become real tours because of discrimination. We weren't allowed to be in the association. Uh, so the founders of NARAP founded the Real TIS, which are black real estate professionals, and they worked together to create a network. And that's how African Americans bought and sold real estate um, in this country. Uh, we started off with two chapters, uh, Chicago, Atlanta grew, Houston came in 1949, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, now to 123 chapters or networks across the uh, country. Uh, and the focus is building black wealth. So at the end of the day, um, we all are, you know, part of other real estate associations, et cetera, but this one association is focused on building black real estate professionals to go out into our communities and build black wealth. So there's a lot of initiatives that we do to do that. But one of the main things is that we are the organization that kind of studies African American home ownership. Uh, one of the big things that we have is our State of Housing in Black America report that we look at what is happening in our communities, how many African Americans own homes, what are the reasons why they don't own a home, and we're able to create policies and legislation uh, for that to increase it and also educate black real estate professionals specifically on how to address the challenges in our community. 
So last year, um, I was in D.C. at yep. the Legislative uh, Caucus, uh, Annual Leadership Conference. Yes. You were on one of the panels with several banks, and yes. I remember you telling a story, or running through a scenario. Yes. Talk about that real quick, and let's talk a little bit more about real estate and its impact of yeah. creating wealth in black communities. Yeah. Go ahead. And this story was, was uh, created by a group in Seattle. And a lot of what's happening in black home ownership and black wealth is systematic racism. A lot of people say, oh, y'all need to pull yourself up from your bootstrap and things of that nature. But it's difficult when there's been policies and strategies against us being able to build wealth. So this scenario is really interesting because it takes two families, a black family and a white family. And it looks at them in Seattle, Washington in 1976. <coughs> And 1976 is critical because that's the last year that redlining was legal in Seattle. So take the White family. White family in 1976 bought a home. So they were able to buy a home. They weren't discriminated against. They purchased it. They had children, had a boy, they had a girl. About 10 years, 10, 20, 10, 15 years later after they bought the house, their kids were college age, time for their ch children to go to college. Well, at this point, the house has almost doubled in value. That's what real estate does. So they're able to pull equity from their home to, to pay for their children to go to college. So their children are able to go to college, graduate without any student loan debt because of the equity in the house that they were able to buy in 1976. Well, their children graduate from college successfully, get started building their, their careers. They do what a lot of couples do. They say, hey, do we really need this big old house? You know, we always almost finished paying it off. You know, we looked at the numbers. It's, it's almost tripled in value. That's what real estate does in 30 years. You know, we're going to sell this house and we're going to buy a condo in downtown Seattle that's brand new. We don't have any maintenance issues. You know, we can just enjoy our retirement. They sell the house. They buy the condo. They have a nice nest egg. A couple of years later, daughter comes and says she's getting married. What an exciting time for the family. The couple has plenty of resources and money to pay for the daughter's wedding. They pay for the daughter's wedding. That couple starts their career and their marriage without any uh, student loan debt or without any wedding debt. Son comes a couple of years later, he's getting married. What's a good wedding gift? Let's give him 20% down from our nest egg to start and, and for him and his wife to be able to buy a house. That's the scenario from the white couple in 1976. Let's talk about the black family. Black family in 1976, redlining is legal. So they don't, they are discriminated against and they don't get a loan to be able to purchase a home. That's what redlining did. So uh, redlining eventually went away. The couple kept working together, um, you know, eventually were able to buy a house. They buy a house in Seattle 10 years later. Same neighborhood, similar house. But guess what? Real estate. Instead of paying $100,000 for the house, the house is worth 50 to 60% more because that's what real estate does. So instead of paying $100,000, they pay $160,000 for the same house that they would have bought 10 years ago, but they couldn't buy it because of the red line. But nonetheless, they're homeowners. They keep moving forward. But now it's time for their kids to go to college about five or six years later. Well, they pay $160,000 for the house, so they pay more. And they've only been there five or six years, so they don't have enough equity in their house to take out a student loan, to, 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 to pull out equity. So their kids go and get student loans so that their kids can go to college. Nonetheless, the kids graduate from, from college. They did well, but they graduate in student loans, the daughter and the son. Now they take this decision and say, well, we got an empty nest. We still got about 10 years left to pay on this house. Do we pay it off? Do we sell it? Well, if we sell it, it's, you know, what can we do if we don't have enough to buy something else cash? So they decide that they're going to stay in place and they're going to retire in this house. But now their retirement house has all windows. The roof needs to be re replaced. It's not energy efficient. So they have to start to plan their retirement dollars to make sure that they're, they can nestle in place in this older home and still be okay. Now their daughter comes and says she's getting married. Now they have wedding expenses for the daughter versus a brand new roof, new windows to make this house energy efficient. So they say, well, baby girl, we can't help you with your wedding, but you know, we're so excited for you, wish you luck. What does she do? She go out, she takes out debt to get married. So now she has student loan debt and wedding debt, which now precludes her from being able to get into a house. 
son comes along, he wants to get married too. The parents are still dealing with the house, trying to pay it off, etc. their retirement. So they don't have anything to help the son. What does this come down to 40 years later from 1976? Yeah, yeah. It's $888,000 worth of wealth for the white family and $28,000 worth of wealth for the black family. Yeah. But it goes all the way back to 1976 in that little house. Yeah. So when NARAB advocates for black home ownership and advocates for special purpose programs and things that help us get over the hump, we're not here because we were lazy. We were here because there were systematic things that prevented us from being able to buy a house. And in real estate, time is your biggest mm -hmm. vehicle to help you gain wealth. So the story just articulates what happened and why we are and where we are and what we see, what we see now. Now, I assume that's a true story? True story. True story. You know, it, it, the thing I think about is, you know, you always hear uh, folks to say, well, I, I didn't own slaves. Well, I wasn't doing that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't do that. Yeah, yeah but yeah. it's kind of like you're benefiting from you it. You benefited from it. Yeah. That's the thing. And it's kind of like, well, so, and I think that speaks to reparations. Some people talk about reparations and things of that nature. It has to be focused. So the thing that I always say when people talk about uh, uh, reparations, Jerome, is racism, systematic racism, was strategic, it was intentional, and it was effective. So to overcome it, you have to do something that's strategic, that's intentional, yeah. that's effective. You can't just, you know, let you all catch up. Yeah. 888,000 versus less than 100,000 is not gonna catch up. Uh, there's, a, there's an old saying, a head start is better than fast running. <laughs> Yeah, 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 <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah. So if you yeah. get that kind of fast start, <laughs> yeah. that kind of head start, it don't care, it don't matter how fast I run, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna be able to catch up. Something has to happen to close, close this gap. gap. Yeah. And that's what we've been saying is something has to happen to close the gap. But you have a lot of people that say, Well, you know, I didn't I didn't you know, I yeah. didn't I, I wasn't there, but you still benefit from it. And this gap is created because of that. And it's nothing that's gonna do no matter how fast you run, you're not gonna close the yeah. gap, something specific, strategic, intentional has to happen to actually close that gap. No, I think that that's, that's, that's powerful and I commend you in the work that you, you and ARAB are, are doing. You're doing some really great work. Thank you. So one of the other topics that was brought up, and I never thought about this neither when we were in DC, was the issue of tangled titles. Yes. And I believe it was said that if we wanted to, um, I forgot, they said something like the biggest way to keep wealth or, or yes. shift wealth was be, would be able to, to hold on to, to tangle titles. So first I'll explain tangle titles. Yes. And to me, like that's what I just thought when you said strategic, that might be a strategic effort to yeah. keep wealth in the community. Correct. Investing Correct. money to clear up some of these titles. But explain yeah. what tang tangle titles are. Yes. And yes. how it's impacting our yes. communities. Yes, for sure. Um, so this whole topic is based on heirs property. How do you pass real estate along? And in our community, a lot of times we just weren't educated on how you pass property along. Uh, so what happens is a person passes along, a senior in our family with property passes on, passes on without a uh, wheel to their property. When they don't have a wheel, and that happens over a couple of generations, the title gets entangled meaning that now it is unclear who really owns the property because it hasn't been probated, it hasn't been willed out. There's multiple children, there's multiple generations of uh, children, so it gets entangled, meaning if I want to sell this property or develop this property or do something with this property, who is really in charge? Who really owns it? Um, and that happens a lot in our uh, community. There was something I was reading that talked about the number of acres that we owned uh, 30 mm -hmm. years ago versus what we yeah. own now. And it's diminished by 80%. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it has diminished because of entangled title. And other communities prey on us when yeah. the title gets entangled and it's difficult to understand ownership, um, who pays the taxes and things of that nature. And someone else from another community scoops in and takes the property because of that. 
So it has been a huge issue in our uh, community. NARAP recently signed on to a bill with Representative Nakima Williams that we're supporting uh, that has funds available if her bill passes. She's asking for funds from HUD to help families work through title issues yeah. um, because that's part of the actual problem is it's five generations back and it's now several hundreds of people that may be involved in this one property. Um, and if it's not handled appropriately with legal representation, et cetera, and it takes dollars to be able to do that, um, then the family can lose that, that uh, property. Yeah. We have a course that we do with NARAB now, and we've curated it with the National Bar Association of Black Lawyers called What to Do with Big Mama's House. In the course, we put as part of our Black Wealth Tour, we've done it in 100 cities. But it's amazing that every city we go to, it's standing room only. Yeah. of black families that want to know what to do with Big Mama's House. We did the Black Wolf tour in this building um, last year. Our first tour stopped. There's a young man came in, had a property in Third Ward, Texas, which you know in mm -hmm. Houston, that's, that's high value. He was the only child, his mother um, was the only child, and this was grandmother's property. He had no real recollection of what happened, but he knows that it's his because he's the only family member. So he said, you know, I wanna, you know, get some access to uh, resources here. City of Houston would give him a new roof with Harvey funds, but he needs the deed to the property. He doesn't have a deed to the property, yeah. so he can't get any access to anything. Uh -huh. He had a stack of papers just that we looked through them, guess what was in there? What's that? The deed the to the property. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't yeah. know what he was looking at. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were able to show him how to go yeah. and get access to this information did a quick little mark analysis, property worth $650,000. Wow. No debt, and he's yeah. behind only two years in taxes. Wow. So he has, you know, a great asset. He just needed some help on how to yeah. really get all the benefits of yeah. what his family had did. You know, I had a similar situation frustrated me. A friend of mine inherited his house from his mother. Yeah. The mother, I th if I'm mistaken, it was in the daddy's name. The daddy had died. It, it was never appropriately recorded. Yeah. He didn't have the deed. The They weren't paying some mortgages. Now it's about to be foreclosed. Yeah. And it's like it was a house that was worth about 300000 He told me, I just want to get rid of it. So, I, you know, I'm yeah. doing what investors do. do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to buy it for a hundred grand. I'm talking to yeah. the to the to the, uh, the mortgage company, the attorneys yeah. and everything. Yeah. But because he didn't have the deed See. and there was no we. I believe, I, I don't know whatever happened with it, but that was 200000 They walked out of both of our lives. Just walked out you of know? the door. And it's, it's kind of frustrating. It really, so, it yeah. really is. But it's it's happening all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it is happening. And so it's one thing to say we're pushing black home ownership to get, get you into a home, but then at the same time, it's going out the bottom. Yeah. At the same time. And the thing that's so frustrating is the people from our communities who bought these homes did it off of third and fourth grade educations mm -hmm. with no resources yep. that scraped yep. and worked to get it under extreme circumstances yeah. and we're losing them <laughs> yeah. under you know yeah. with all the resources available to us yeah. in the world so yeah. that's that's the real yeah. frustrating part yeah. so one more question i want to talk about real estate as a career and as a business like i said yeah. i got my license when i was 20 years old yeah and I was just looking for financial freedom. I want to have my own business. Real yes. estate seemed like a quick and easy way to get in. Yes. Um, everybody's trying to get into real estate now. Mm -hmm. I think I heard a stat, something to the effect of 80% of all the realtors do 20% of the business, 20% yeah. of the realtors do 80%. <laughs> That's how it goes. Which suggests most of the people have a license and they, they think nothing. they're going to get rich, but they ain't doing nothing yep. with it. That's how it goes. So what would you say, uh, what would be your advice to someone that's thinking about getting into real estate yeah. and, and doing it as a career? I mean, yeah. should they get their license if they're not going to do it full time? So you know? I did not start full full time. Okay. I was part time for four years. Yeah. Um, and I did well. And I basically waited until I had you know, a couple of but years. You're a little worth. bit different. You grew couple up in it. You understood it. But I still didn't go full time. Yeah. I got people who, you know, get their yeah. license tomorrow, no background, no family history, and they like, I'm going all the way in. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. Yeah. Um, real estate can be tough. Um, real estate also too, you have a fiduciary responsibility. And you never want to get yourself in a financial situation 
where you're not able to be a good fiduciary, a good yeah. consultant to your client. So that's number one is make sure that your financial financial stable. Number two, I would encourage people, residential is the easiest way to, to start for various reasons, but we really are missing the boat, Jerome, on commercial, commercial. real estate. Yeah. We're really missing the boat. Um, and there's a lot of opportunity for us in commercial real estate. So if there's somebody who's coming from a corporate career, has some corporate relationships and business acumen, I would really encourage them to look at going straight into commercial real estate and skipping residential mm -hmm. real estate, which is very saturated. Yeah. Um, number three, and my dad really impressed this upon me, is get involved in associations. So when I quit my job to go into real estate full time, that's when he said, you're gonna join NARAD. You're gonna go, you're gonna be on the board, you're gonna be a professional, you're yeah. gonna be in the industry, you're gonna understand what's going on. You're not just gonna be selling real estate on the back of your car and just rolling around here, you know, with your car and, and, and your little, you know, T-shirt. Yeah. You're gonna be a part of this industry. You're gonna understand what's going on. You're gonna be a professional. Uh, you're gonna be well-trained. Those are the things that make you have the longevity in the business and not yeah. just be a fly-by-night agent. And I tried it for a year and I didn't make any money. Yeah. When I'm in the industry and I understand what's going on, I understand black home ownership, I understand why we didn't get approved for the loan. All of that helps me be a better professional yeah. and understand the overall industry and the, and the ecosystem of yeah. it. And it gets me relationships to be successful. Yeah. I remember when COVID hit, and um, there were so many, you know, multiple offer situations and hard to get a property for your client. I use my network of other real estate professionals that I've gained relationships with over the past 20 plus years. That's how you keep your business yeah. Yeah. moving. Um, we, I just was working this morning on the RFP uh, for an institutional client. Me and another partner, Kevin Riles, who's a commercial broker, we met in the Houston Black Real Estate Association mm -hmm. in NARAB, and we've been doing partnerships on six or seven of these major institutional clients yeah. that do major real estate. But we met in the association yeah. that my dad told me to join and be a professional yeah. and not just be out here in my car yeah. rolling around. So my advice is to be a part of the real estate community. It's almost like when we have a kid that, go to, that goes to college. I'm gonna recommend my kid, don't, don't live at home, yeah. live on campus. Yeah. When you live on campus, you're part of the community, you're part of the sororities, fraternities, yeah. you're part of clubs. You know what's going on and you're a real part of college. Not just living at home, just kind of going to class yeah. every, every once in a while. So I would really say be involved in yeah. NARAB, be involved in other associations that's gonna make you a true real estate professional. Awesome. Well, I think that's our time today. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to share? Social media handles, yeah. anything about the wealth tour that you'd like to share before we okay. go? Okay, I got lots. Okay. Uh, my social media handle is at uh, Courtney J. Rose 1913. Follow NARAB at N-A-R-E-B underscore Realtors dot com. Um, our website is NARAB dot com. My personal website is Courtney Johnson Rose dot com. We do have a big conference coming up in New Orleans for NARAB life-changing, Master P, Music Soul Trial, Dr. Jamal Bryant, Jonathan McReynolds, Dougie Fresh, Terry Watson, just amazing. July 31st through August, August the 4th, NARABconvention.com to get more information. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you for joining us on the yeah. Black Money Tree Podcast, and thank you so much for tuning in. Until next time.